for today. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4, if you would, please. Acts chapter 4. Fear is torment. Title of this message will be Fear is Torment. The Bible tells us that, and we know that. There's several different types of fear, and uh, probably the greatest is the fear of death. People have a fear of dying, but it shouldn't be for the Christian. God took the stinger out of death. God gave us the victory over the grave. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Paul said, I'd much rather go on and be with the Lord than stay around you, but it's needful that God wants me to stay here. And that's exactly the way we should feel about it. And uh, we've went through the different times about the Lord coming and getting us one day. In Acts chapter 4, but I want to talk to you about we'd rather obey God than to obey man. I don't know if uh, somebody at Dama showed me, and I guess it got somewhere on the internet, this preacher in Canada. How I many has followed this? His, his name is James Cokes. Cokes. He's in jail. They fined him several hundred dollars for preaching and uh, having church, and now they put him in jail. And they said if he would repent for more, tell him if he would stop preaching that they'd let him out of jail. You know, I thought about another man at that time and, and uh, how he was, and his name was John Bunyan. How many read the story of, uh, that's something you should read if you haven't. They told him that, 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 of course, they want him to abide by the government church, or the state church, and so forth, and if he'd do that, that they'd let him out of jail. He told his wife, he said, they put the paper there, all he had to do is sign it. Right there, did. he had a little girl that was blind too. They told him if he'd uh, agreed to do what they'd asked him to do in preaching and so forth, that uh, they'd let him out. He told his wife, he said, if I reach for that paper, cut my arm off. He said, I'm gonna preach the word of God. And this young man is the same way. He said, I'm gonna preach the word of God. And I got to thinking about that, and then I was reading the devotion, and it, it lined up the same thing I was reading about with him. So I thought God wanted me to say something about it too, so I know he did anyways. But I'm going to, before we read, let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we've had together here this morning in the good Sunday school class. And God, now we pray that you would give us the liberty, the boldness, and the power to preach the precious Word of God, and we'd be sensitive to the Holy Spirit that every need would be met through the Word of God and each person here tonight or today that they would realize that we have a God that we can trust 100% and He'll take care of us. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, in chapter 4, look in, if you would with me, look at verse 18 and 19. Chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. This is apostles, of course, and they said, and they called them and commanded them, commanded them, this is the government, of course, not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Do you know how many places, that, that even in our capital and uh, in uh, Congress and so forth, when they pray, they're not allowed to use the name of Jesus in Congress. And it's time and places again. And a lot of the schools have said, you can pray, but don't use the name of Jesus. But that is the name. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved in that lovely name of Jesus. I hope you never bow down to that. Act. But we'll look what Peter said. Next verse, 19. But Peter and John answered both of them and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so they did, you know, and of course we go on, we'll get some more scripture later on. Fear has swept across our country. It's all over our country. And now Christians have no reason to fear. I know they have a reason to be home some of them because they're old and they're sick and different things, and that's for sure. Because of the Chinese virus, 
I believe God knew that virus was coming before it ever got here. I believe God's controlling that virus right now. I believe that with them. When he decides to shut it down, he'll shut it down. If he doesn't, we'll live with it and trust in God. It goes on. We, sh we should be as safe and protective as possible about this thing. We shouldn't be stupid about it. Okay? I've had it. I know what I'm talking about. I've had the virus, and I've had one of the shots going to get another, and I should be allergic to it then. I don't know about that, you know. But always, but I've trusted God when I had it, and I trusted God before I had it, and I'll trust God for as long as I live, because He's been good to me and kept every promise. He goes on, uh, we can't stop having church. Listen, preaching and witnessing. That's what God called us to do. I don't want to read you something here. This is the First Amendment in our con Constitution. Congress shall not or shall make no law respecting on, uh, on an establishment of religion, no law, or prohibiting the free exercise of. Congress can't make a law to do that. And neither can the government up in Charleston make a law to do that either. Listen, prohibiting the free exercise of or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. They don't, this is the First Amendment in our Congress is to keep the church free from the government. Church is not part of the government. The church is away from the government. This is the greatest institution ever established. It's greater than any, any government that's ever been established. Amen. Our government was established, at the, the first government was established upon one thing, one reason why they got, is to protect this country. But now they've got their nose in everything in the world. And they want to control your life. They want to control my life. And get rid of Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches. Now, they're putting them in jail in different places. They'll be here next. Right. We're going to have to take a stand. Amen. I want you to know that. Listen, I, I think of some folks, you know, that, 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 that this, this year uh, I got a friend up there in, in, in uh, Virginia. Didn't get saved until he was 86 years old. But I thought if I'd have never went to see him, made that point to go see him, he'd, when I got talking to him and so forth, he had read my book and all that. And I said, Fred, do you go to church or have you been to church? He said, I've been one time in my life. I said, the preacher said something I didn't like and then go back. I said, have you thought about being saved? He said, yeah, after I read that book of yours in the track. And uh, I said, would you like to be saved? Yes. He got gloriously saved that night, that day. Come to the church that night, Dale was preaching, he come forward. He's been in church ever since. He's got leukemia, he's dying. He knows he's dying. But he said, I know where I'm going. I've been back up there to see him one time. He said, I know where I'm going. That, that's just taking time out to go see somebody pretty far away, but it was a blessing. Fred taught me more about mechanics than anybody in this world. I went to school for two years for it. Fred taught me more in a year's time than, than I was with him several years. He was right beside of me as he taught me down through the year. The fear, and this, and this is something else. And then there's another 93-year-old man, Kathy's uncle, uh, Brother Lacey. He's up in heaven now, too. Freddie's 93, I, I should have told you. Lacey was 93 years old when he left out of this old world. I met him in a barber shop down here in Pies. I became his friend. And I asked him if I'd come to his house, and I went to his house a few times, and then he got sick. He had a stroke. They was doing these carotid arteries here. And he went to the hospital, and after he had a stroke from it, Kathy called me and said, her Uncle Lacey wanted to see me. I went to see him. He wanted to be saved. When he was able, he come and was baptized, and you could see him every Sunday morning sitting back over about where Rachel is now. 
You could see him around us, the weather was bad or something, he couldn't get out or something. But he's in heaven now. Somebody has to witness to these people. And Kathy had, I'm sure, many times, and other people too, probably. But he got saved and went to heaven. And uh, a Reba Lamb that I was with in Mount Jackson, I'm talking about two, uh, three 93 year old people. I preached the funeral. I haven't preached Fred, there, of course, but he, he's, I talked to him this week. She's one of the sweetest ladies I know. She loved the Lord. She was in church with us there at Mount Jackson and was saved and followed the Lord and went to church every time the doors opened. I know we'd go down there in her church at Cheesy Creek. She, when we'd go down there to visit, she had always come. And she wasn't able to come, but she'd make sure her daughters brought her over there, preached her funeral. She went to heaven. I'm talking about these people that we know and brothers and sisters and so forth. Fear is torment. Over in 1 John, the Bible tells us in chapter 4 and verse 8, it's, it's important that we know about this. Chapter 4 and verse 8. 18, I'm sorry, I said 8, didn't I? Verse 18. Look what the Bible says about fear. You need to know these. There is no fear in love. Real love. I'm talking about agape love, God's love. But perfect love casteth out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Not trusting God. You might be saved, but they're not trusting God. Sometimes they can't come. We know that, and you know that. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Fearing man is, is, is something that a lot of people are afraid to talk to man, and a lot of people are afraid of different things that happen when they talk. Maybe their position, maybe their power, or whatever, if they say anything about the Lord. Proverbs 29, 25. Fear of death is the greatest fear there is. I've been afraid of dying before I was saved. Many times I was afraid of dying when I was in Vietnam. Many times. But I didn't know. I didn't know God. Let me get a drink of this. Do I want to die? No. I want to live as long as God wants me to, but I want to preach and teach and witness for the Lord as long as I live. That's my goal in life. Has been for years. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he tells us very plainly, this is what he says. Behold, I show you a mystery in verse 51. We shall not all sleep. Of course, we're going to be chained. But we shall be chained in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The last trump at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be chained. For the incorruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the, this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Listen, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? What he goes on to say. The sting of death is sin. So what happened to our sin? Jesus forgave us. It's not that we have records been wiped clean. We don't even have a record of sin when it comes to salvation. The sting of death is sin. And it goes on to say here, and the strength of sin is the law. Of course, the law tells us we are sinners. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us what? The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death has no reason to be feared. Perfect love casteth out all that fear. When you got saved, when I got saved, God shed His love abroad in your heart and my heart. And He's promised that nothing can ever separate you from that love. Separate me from that love. Nothing in this world can. Nothing created, He said, Romans 
chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. We don't have time to read all that. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Fear of the Lord is what it should be in our life. That means reverential trust. That means I'm trusting in Him reverently, trusting in Him. He said, don't fear man. He said, the only thing he can do is kill the body or kill the flesh. But fear God, who controls not only the body, but it also controls the spirit and the life eternity. It can keep you out of hell and make sure you're on your way to heaven. Fear of death, fear of God, reverential trust and hatred of evil, and hatred of evil. Go on. The beginning of fear. When did fear ever exist? When did it start? Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I better take this watch off and hide it over our next to the pulpit there. Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to get over to it just in these pages. I don't want to come apart this morning. Look in verse 10, chapter 3. This is after Adam and Eve had sinned. They had partaken of the tree of life in the middle of the garden. And he said, first of all, God called to him in verse 9, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Every day he come down and fellowship with them, talk to them. But this day they wasn't out there where they should be. They was hiding. Said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was, what does it say there? Afraid. That's the first time you'll see that word. I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. God asked him who told him all that, of course. But he was naked. He never realized it. Before, he didn't even realize he was naked. There was no sin in the world. Adam and Eve were born without sin, or created, not born, created without sin, and so forth. It's so important that we realize these things, and sin is what causes fear. Sin is what causes fear. That's where it stemmed from. And he said, perfect love casts out this fear. Perfect love will cast that fear out and keep it out of you. The beginning of fear. God does not want his children to fear. If God be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He said, you know, we're not to fear of the world. He said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And we're more than conquerors through him that loved us and saved us. What have we got to be afraid about? Not to be stupid now. Not to be ignorant about things and so forth. The first mention, being afraid, sin. God wants us to trust him. Just like I read that verse there. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalm 19.9. The beginning of fear and the beginning of persecution. The worst persecution, not always through the Bible, of course, the Christians have been persecuted, but we can see that the Lord was persecuted. He said, they hated me and they'll hate you. They persecuted me and they'll persecute you. Because this world is not our home. This world, the prince of this world is Satan. And that's what the flesh lusts after all the time. The lust of the flesh is for the world. It's not for God. There's no good thing comes out of the flesh. That's why we got to get rid of this body and get a new one before we go to heaven. And we will. And we will. It started, you know, of course, and Calvary was persecuted. Of course, we talked about when he was dying, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. 
and we didn't. And Terry sang that beautiful song when I saw him the first time. You remember I was talking the other night about Job or last Sunday, I think. Job, he, he knew the Lord, and God said he was the righteous man on earth right then, the most righteous. He skewed a thiel. Down through the world, it, you know, the, his friends called enemies, uh, was his enemies, his friends, so forth, and called him a hypocrite. And Job did, didn't think that was right, of course. But later on, when he saw the Lord, he said, I've heard of him in chapter 44. I've heard of him, but now I've seen. He said, and I am undone. There's sin in my life. He repented, and things changed in his life. Then we go on, that persecution, when they was trying Jesus, they couldn't find no fault with him, never did. He's perfect, but he was persecution has always been. Jesus said it. And persecution should not stop us from preaching the gospel. Back in our text, we, I want you to look with me. We're just a minute here now. In chapter 4, 19 and 20, look with me. I said that before, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto him more, more than God, unto God, judge you. He went on to talk, but then he goes on to talk about some more things here too. And then we see this. Fear brings torment. I talked about that, but the persecution should stop us from preaching. It should not stop us from preaching the gospel and, te and witnessing the word of God. They had people that it's in different positions in, in, in the Lord, uh, some leaders and so forth back then. They was different positions and so forth. And I was thinking about over there in, in uh, Matthew or, or Mark, I forget which it was. I had, uh, I had it marked, but I didn't, I didn't have it marked. There it is. John's where I have it here. Look at these that, that were scared to have a fear of man. John in chapter 12, it says in verse 42, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. Many believed on him. And because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They were scared of the Pharisees. Sometimes the fear of man will bring a snare. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue if they believed on Jesus Christ. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That stopped a many a man, a many a woman, from proclaiming the word of God when they should. They love the praise of men. I'd rather have them accepting me than God accepting me. I'd rather please them than I'd rather for, to please God. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with them. Said many have believed on him. This is what they did. Fear will bring torment to us. We talked about that. What are we fearing? Fear of sickness? He's a great physician, is he not? He doesn't heal everybody. Some of them he takes off to heaven which is far better. Paul said he was called up into heaven. He should know. Which I believe it's far better too. But do we go out here and try to get sick and try to get killed or something? No. We want to live as healthy as we can, as long as we can, and proclaim the word of God. God left us here to go into all the world and be a witness. We talked about that that last week. All the, I've got a list of, at uh, Frank gave me of all the missionaries and the people that are out there serving the Lord in the mission field, and we support them. We're taking, that word is taken out all over the world for us, and that's the way it should be. Fear of sickness. Jesus is a great physician. The Bible tells us sometimes God takes us home. James 5, 15, prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. You say, well, what if he dies? 
He's still going to raise him up. He's going to take him to heaven. Take him a little further than what he was thinking about going, but he'll take you there. We miss them, but they don't miss us. All things become new for them. They don't miss us. It wouldn't be heaven if they missed us. We don't, they don't see what's going on here on earth. If it did, it wouldn't be heaven. It's a perfect place with a perfect Savior and a perfect people in heaven. Thank God for it. God talks about the fear of dying. We talked about that. God took the stinger out of death. God gave us the victory over the grave. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord immediately. At the moment, the twinkling of an eye. Fear of man, we talked about that. John chapter 12, and verse 42 and 43. Praise of men rather than the praise of God. They'd rather have men. Fear, fear of man bringeth a snare in our trusting God. And then the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 3, 7. That's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. I don't, you probably know where I'm going. And then it's been Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 7. This is really the key to the whole, whole book of Proverbs. This is the key to it. Look in verse 7 if you can. You don't have to write it down somewhere. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. It's the beginning. When we trust the Lord for salvation by grace, through His love and through His mercy, the fear of the Lord is a beginning of knowledge. Look what he goes on to say. But fools, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But the fear of the Lord is a beginning of knowledge. There's a song somebody that used to, I just started living. And you didn't start living the life that God wants you to live until you begin to fear the Lord. And that's when life begins to go on for you. There's nothing like it in all this world. Afraid to do something? No, I don't want to displease him. We talked the other day about Christian sinning. What he's told us very plainly in Galatians 6, 7. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap here on earth. It's important. They threatened them, and Acts back in their text now there, they threatened them. And how the, it, it's sad that what was going on with this bunch, but it, listen, it's just as bad today, or even worse. Chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, if you'll turn there with me. In verse 28. In verse 28. Look what they said. Saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled, listen, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intent to bring this man's blood upon us. No fear. They didn't fear what was going to happen to them. Did you know these same men that we're speaking of now were John, he was put on Patmos Island that hoping the buzzards would eat his flesh and kill him. But instead he got a book of revelations from God to pin down for us. He was the only one that wasn't martyred out of those apostles. All of them died a martyr's death because they preached the Word of God. Aren't you glad they did? Paul had his head cut off. He was a missionary to the Gentiles. That's you and me. But he was willing to die. He was willing to die for the work of God because he knew that it was far better for him to continue and do what God wanted him to do than to back off from it. Even when he was in prison, didn't make no difference to Paul, wherever he's at. I still got to drive the medicine I take, I guess. Excuse me. But Paul had, had 
some wonderful things to say about the Lord and, and what he was all about. For I am a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He, he tells us, he goes on, and having this confidence, I know, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all your further, for the further to enjoy of faith. This is so important, you know, what God's talking about. He said, always, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. And nothing I shall be ashamed. Listen, this man was chained to Roman soldiers in a dungeon. Dale's been into that dungeon where they had him and everything. I didn't get to go when I was over. But that with all boldness, all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. If there's anything we should pray, we should pray when we're dying or when we die, that we die glorifying the Lord, lifting up the name which is above every name, lifting up the one who went to Calvary and bled and died for your sins and my sins, lifting up the one who resurrected from the dead and defeated death, hell, and the grave for you and me, lifting up that name that he ascended up on high. He's on the right hand of God now, interceding for you and me every night and every day, forever, without sleep or slumber. He's up there for us. He don't you to know that, and it's wonderful. Chapter 4, back in our text now, and verse 29, I want you to see that before we get too far from this. Chapter 4 and verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. It didn't matter what they threatened. They threatened them with death. They finally did kill them but they was going to stand up. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we are under the biggest threat that we've ever been since I've been born. As far as freedom of religion or whatever you want to call it, and preaching and Bible-believing churches. Now, if you want to belong to some liberal thing, Archer, where they believe about the same way they do up there in Congress, that's all right. You can belong to that. But if you belong to one who literally believes this precious Bible like we do here and who teaches good doctrine, sound doctrine, like we do here, then you're, they're after you. They want you out of the way. I heard one of them say years ago, a few years back, he said the biggest threat we have in America is Christians. The biggest threat we have in America is Christians. They'll stop it all. It's sad. That precious verse there tells you God has not given us a spirit of fear. He has not given us a spirit of fear. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. You've heard me bring this verse to you many, many times. 2 Timothy and verse 7. If you don't mark nothing else in the Bible, you mark this in your Bible. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. You remember what Paul said up there in, in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16? He said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Whosoever believed in it, he said, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of it, he said. And look what he goes on to say here. Power, you've got the same power Paul had. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you if you're saved. And of love. No one ever loved me. and No one ever cared for me like Jesus does. No one, nobody will ever love you. No one will ever care for you. What more can a friend do than to lay down his life for you? And of a sound mind. 
I didn't have a mind until Christ came into my life. I didn't know what living was. You didn't either. You said, but I did this and I did that. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. But I didn't get a sound mind and a true mind until Jesus Christ came into my life. And I began to be conformed, transforming my mind through the Word of God. And then I got, began to have a sound mind. Then I began to know what living was all about. Then I began to know what it was to love my family and love my wife the way I should. Then I began to my children, my grandchildren. And then I began to know the work of God and love the work of God. Two weeks after I was saved, I went out soul winning with a deacon in church that thought enough of me to ask me to go out. And I thank God, and I'm still going. And I love it, every minute of it, taking the Word of God and telling people about Jesus Christ. There's nothing like it in all this world. Thanks be unto God. Second Timothy 1.7, power, love, and a sound mind. Isn't that something to have? God, let this, Paul said over there in, in, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. Amen. Then he tells us over in Romans chapter 12, and Eric brought it out the other night on us, he says that, that our minds need to be transformed. And it's important that we know that and, and understand that, you know. It, it's so important, and the only way you're going to get them transformed is through the Word of God. Here he says it, I beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That's the flesh. That's the flesh. But be ye transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. Be you, in your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He wants us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us, as we began, or where I said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's when we just began, when we start. But we should be maturing out and grow up. Sound mind. Transform mind through the Word of God. But of power and love and unconditional, everlasting, sound mind, and so on, he talks about. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, I told you, and I, I spoke to you about John Bunyan. John Bunyan was a man that loved the Lord, and what a blessing it was to know that he stuck by his guns. He never let up. And he wrote that Pilgrim's Prophet progress on little lids off of the bottles, milk lids or something off the bottles. He wrote that whole Pilgrim's Progress on that. It's been read by millions and millions of people. It's still one of the books that every Christian should live, read, and understand. might not understand it all, but he'll sure give it to you where you can. And thank God for it. Fear is torment. Trust in the Lord is a blessing. You and I both know the fear of the Lord is clean and doing forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. He's never led you, uh, he's never led you wrong. He's never spoke to you wrong and so forth. I told you a long time ago, my favorite verses, two of them in the Bible, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I didn't know what was going on in my life, and God gave me those two verses back in, I think it was 1988, maybe 89, early 89. But I put them in my heart, and I kept them there. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, trust him, and he will, he will, he will direct your paths. 
That's one of the greatest promises in the Bible for the Christian. Trust in the Lord. You've got nothing to be afraid of. I know there's things that come into our life we get anxious about. I know there's things that we grieve about. Weep with the, those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. God gave us tears to release those emotions when it comes time to reap. But he gave us also that joy unspeakable and full of glory down in our hearts. It never leaves. He gave us peace, peace that patheth all understanding to keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And he said, the peace I leave with you is not what the world leaves with you. If God gave us the peace, we're not going to let the world take it away, are we? If God gives us his joy, we're not going to let the world take it away, are we? We can do it. Because God has given us the strength to stand to our feet.